You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. I got the power. I got the power. Wow. I was almost uh, about to go into Space Jam, but <laughs> fortunately, I got the power came in the way first, and we didn't mess that one up. All right. How's it going, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone Podcast. I'm your host, Jimmy Wong. How is it? It's Josh Lee Kwai. We are this here. Yeah, so, <laughs> um, what, a couple weeks ago now, we did our question time giveaway contest for the Aftermath and Last Stand playmats. And Got a bunch of stuff to y'all. Yeah, and uh, in order to enter the contest, everybody out there had to send us a question in the email. We got over 3,000 emails. Have you ever seen an inbox that just says one thing? <laughs> question time, question time, question time, question time. <laughs> yeah. That was amazing to see. The response was awesome. So thank you all for doing that. So obviously that's a lot of questions and it's going to take us a while to go through them all. Uh, our plan is to kind of chip away at it yeah. over the next, well, number of months. Thank but, you for the block of marble. Yeah, but as we start to go through it, we have noticed some patterns already, which is great because you, uh, everybody out there is feeding us some topic ideas. And one of the things that stood out to us is a question that's getting asked a lot or a topic that's getting broached a lot. Not everybody's asking the exact same question, but something around this yeah. topic. And, you know, we always t we always advocate, like, a quick conversation before everybody sits down for the, for the commander game of, like, hey, on a power scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, what's everybody's deck at? And hopefully everyone answers correctly, so then everyone can then go into a game and just make sure that there's no one deck that's going to end the game really quickly, or with someone that doesn't really play the game because of the way their deck's built. But it's a very confusing thing because it's all relative. My 10 could be different than Josh's 10, and your 6 is probably different than mine too. Yeah, so we get a ton of questions just like, how do I rank my deck? How do I de determine what the power level is? And we've always said it's more art than science, but mm -hmm. we're going to try and put a little more science into it today to give everybody a little bit more context. So maybe they're not so nervous about, you know, ranking their deck and maybe they can get, be a little more accurate. Yep. It's going to be a fun one. And if you want to, you know, power up your deck or power down your deck, we got to buy cards. And the way to do that is by going to cardkingdom.com slash command zone. That's our affiliate link. We say it every single time. So you probably are sick and tired of saying it, but don't worry. It still works and it still supports the show and you get to buy the cards you want with great shipping. Yeah, you're going to buy Magic Cards anyway. Just use that affiliate link when you do, and you really are supporting all of our content. Also, another way to support everything we do is by purchasing stuff from our other sponsor, which is Ultra Pro. Yeah, We've yeah, been yeah. talking a lot lately about their Satin Tower deck boxes, which I think is one of their best products because they're so solid. Your deck's going to be so safe in there. Plus, there's a little... Uh, area at the bottom to hold dice, which I find very useful because I don't always want to carry my full-on backpack yeah. you know, when I go out. like Sometimes just two deck boxes and the dice are already in there is really, really convenient. Just having a single isolated unit where you're like, yeah. this is it. This is everything I need to play a game of Commander sans a playmat, of course. Yeah, it's true, but they do make playmats and sleeves and everything else you need to protect all of your cards. So Ultra Pro, always awesome, always helping us to make our content. And the final way to support everything is on Patreon. In fact, we call out one lucky patron every single episode. Yee. And this episode is dedicated to... Blaine, Blaine Waterbury. Waterbury. Woohoo! Blaine, you rock. All right. uh, well, we should give out the Patreon now. Patreon.com slash command zone. My yes. bad. If oh. you want, you could be one of those names. You never know. <laughs> uh, and the last way to support our stuff, and it's for a limited time only at the moment, is our Kickstarter that we're running right now to help us improve game nights. And now we're, we've hit our main goal. We're into stretch goals. And so it's game nights, extra turns, some additional content for next year. We also have a bunch of cool rewards. Yeah, a lot of exclusive stuff, including a really awesome coin that looks great, feels great, and you can use it on the battlefield and I've always wanted to have, usually I use a dice, but like, I'm like, oh, the number on top is distracting me. This is the thing to get. And we've also never really done a fundraiser for just Kickstarter and extra turns, which is something you all ask for a bunch. So make sure you check out the Kickstarter before it ends, because it will end. And at that point, you won't be able to get in the stuff anymore. That's just how it works. The link will be in the show notes below. We're tweeting about it all the time. Where It's on our Instagram. We have an Instagram now too. So go check it out. Facebook, too. Yeah, the coin is really awesome, I gotta and say. And word of mouth. That's true. <laughs> Paperboy, come through town. <laughs> All right, let's go to the main topic here, which is how to gauge the power level of your deck. Um, do you want to explain the 1 to 10 ranking system really quickly? It's yeah, simple. But... It's very simple. 1 is my deck is basically 
not a deck. It doesn't really do much, but this 100 cards put together. And 10 is my deck is going to combo out on turn 3 or 4, or have so much interaction in it that it can shut you out of the game while generating infinite advantage. Whatever it is, my deck is very lethal. So if you imagine it as a dull blade, a not even a butter knife is a one, by the way. It's like, like a, a spoon. <laughs> yeah. How are you going to cut something with a spoon? You have to turn it around or use the side. It's not great. And then 10 is like a master level samurai sword. Yeah. Folded steel 2,500 times. Yeah, it slices through anything. And uh, in the middle, I don't know, we got some cleavers. We got some, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So I people get really nervous about this. They ask us all the time. Uh, I'd say like 10% of the questions out of the 3,000 so far. That, well, I haven't gone through all 3,000, but have been about grading your deck, ranking it. And I think a lot of people just worry. They have a small play group or mm -hmm. uh, they only play at one LGS. Um, they don't have the context I th that they think is necessary to even know, like, is my deck a six? Is it an eight? In my play group, it might be an eight, but then I might go out into the wide world of Commander and find out that that's really a five. And they get worried that they're not ranking their decks correctly. And so this episode is kind of to give you more confidence uh, so you have a little bit more context I want to give a couple disclaimers here. There's going to be a few <laughs> in this episode. Yeah. So, it's so relative. It is more art than science. I said that already, but really the important part, I think, of this whole process that we've always advocated, like have that conversation at the start of the game, is the conversation. Yeah. Right? Like just taking that step of being like, hey, everybody's trying at least to level the playing field at the start. That's good. Now, sometimes you're going to mismatch the power levels a little bit. Also, I don't think, like if I say, hey, I'm playing a six... The expectation is not that everyone else plays a six. Right. The expectation is that nobody plays a 10 and nobody plays a one. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to match exact power levels. What you're trying to do is get in a reasonable ballpark so that nobody just gets completely stomped. But if somebody's like, hey, I've got a four, a six and a four can be in the same pod together. If everybody else is playing a four and you're playing a six, they're going to know it. They should know it. Maybe they'll come after you first. Yeah. I, yeah, I was just thinking about this on a deeper level, which is like, the way you represent yourself at the table is a very large part of what makes Commander fun because you're going into an hour and a half to two hour to three hour to who knows how many hour Hopefully process. Hopefully not three hour. Yeah, and, and you don't want to lose and waste that time. And Commander players and Magic players are all about value. And also we're in a format where I don't think it's like tech to hide the secrets of your deck. Unless you want to do something that's a fun surprise or whatever it is, but being honest about your deck's power level, I think, is always going to create a much better environment. Yeah, I mean, of course... We also advocate you telling the truth about the <laughs> ranking of your deck and not purposefully, well, I'll just call it yeah. lying, you know, yeah. <laughs> about it. However, it can be, I mean, listen, there is something to be said for people that like the scales are going to be slightly different for everybody. That's just the reality of the situation because there's no way to put your deck on, you know, feed it into a computer and it's going to spit out exactly your deck is a 7.2 yeah. out of 10. And even if you are being completely honest and it just happens that your rating's different than someone else, it doesn't make that person wrong. It's just literally relative to them. Right. So try and be honest. Again, we're going to roll through all this stuff. I do want to say also, if there are bad actors, meaning people that are going to be deceitful on purpose about this, there's not a lot this system can do to combat that. We also can't combat the fact that, hey, somebody could run 98 cards in their deck or two copies yeah, of a certain true. card or whatever. Like if somebody wants to cheat is a casual format, it's going to be tough. You will know if you play with that person enough that something's going on there. Yeah, something fishy. Yeah, and in which case you should, uh, you should, in, I don't know, talk to that person or tackle, no, tackle that situation tackle, the same way yeah. you would kind of if you think that they're not running enough cards or cheating in some other way if, if it's a pattern of behavior. But, you know... We're not going to be able to set up a system that just makes it so people can't cheat that part ever. of it. Like, yeah. like no one ever is going to say their deck is a seven when it's really an eight. Like, yeah, that's it's just not it's not possible for us to set up that system. So, OK, um, over a year ago now, we did an episode. It was number 217 called How to Power Up Your Decks. And this was one of DJ's first episodes filling in for you, Jimmy, when you went to New Zealand. Uh, and that is a related topic to this one. So two things here. One, we're going to refer to it a little bit. And two you should go watch that video after this one's over. It is great. I yeah. do love DJ. So DJ separated the numbers uh, into essentially small sections. I just basically said spoon to samurai knife, but this is a much better version of that. So DJ's uh, numbers are as follows. If your deck is jank, it's going to be a 1 to a 2 on the power level. If it's casual, it's a 3 to a 4. If it's focused, it's a 5 to a 6. If it's optimized, great word by the way, 7 to an 8. And if it's competitive, it's a 9 to a 10. Whew. But what do all those words and numbers mean, Jimmy? I don't know. Use a dictionary, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> what does the number one mean? Interesting. So we're going to go through each of these 
categories, each of these number rankings, and we're going to list some uh, attributes and aspects. Yeah, that each of them might have. Now, that doesn't mean every deck has to have all the attributes, has to check all the boxes in each of these uh, categories. But these are some things that are going to be common to that category, we think. Mm -hmm. um, Friends, even? Yeah. Yeah. And we also want, I also want to say, and this gets, this gets forgotten a lot, which is ironic when we talk about magic, but all of this is disregarding player skill. Yeah, that's very true. Like, I mean, Melissa DeToro could spank me with a casual three to four deck easily. Just crush me. Right. Any exactly. of them. Any of the pros probably could. <laughs> They're definitely going to play it. You know, it's going to punch above its weight a right. little bit when a better player is playing it than a worse. Now, can a four on the power scale beat a 10 straight up? You know, that's going to be very, very difficult no matter how good of a player you are. But none right. of this is talking about how good you are as a player. It's just the deck itself. And you should be able to move the numbers a little with your player skill. Never forget that. Okay, Jank, the number one category, which is a one to two on our power level scale. We're not trying to be um, mean or, or condescending towards any of the decks no, in the one to two no. category. This, th These decks do emerge from the world in a few ways, though. And one of them is, like you said, sometimes like my first commander deck was a one to a two. Straight up. It just had cards I thought were cool, and it didn't work at all. I actually bet your deck was higher on the power level scale than that. Because I think jank Maybe. decks are actually underpowered on purpose. Ah, okay. So I think a jank deck is like a, all my creatures have hats on. Ah, the classic Or one, uh, one. all the cards are miscut. We saw that one at one of yeah, our parties once. that was awesome. Uh, they have some weird strategy or some other thing. My deck is a... Lord of the Rings deck, and everything has to have something to do with Lord of the Rings. So, and the altars, too, match that and all that. Yeah, and so they're making decisions for their deck that are based on factors other than winning. They're trying to tell a story. They're trying to do something goofy. A lot of these decks are one to twos. It doesn't mean the person doesn't know how to build a better deck that's right. more powerful. I'm going to say better sometimes when I mean more powerful. I, I, I apologize for that. Interchangeable. Yeah. Um, a lot of times these decks don't even really have a real win con. Like I play uh, with a guy, Bradley Rose, who follows us on Twitter and interacts with us a lot. And he has a deck and the whole deck is actually you supposed to guess the theme. Your opponents are supposed to guess the theme of the deck. And like every card he plays, you're like studying it, trying to, Get you know, through the, the, the story. draw the lines to the other card <laughs> he's got out and figure out what the heck's going on. That deck's not very good, but that's not what Bradley's trying to do. Yeah. He's not trying to win the game of Commander. He's doing a different thing, and that's where the one to twos fall, I think. Yeah, and Jack, Jank decks really only have a chance of winning if somehow they are the lucky thing that's standing in the crumbling building, and they're just standing at the end and need to just, like, sort of kick something to finish it off. I mean, Jank decks might play, like, a Craw Worm, which is a really bad card, except for it is a 6-4, and at some point in a game, it might yeah, be possible that, like, hey, swinging with my 6-4 actually killed somebody that can happen so jank decks don't have like no ability to win but they're very low and they're not really trying to win yeah. so that's like a one and a two i also say they're there. pretty rare uh, yeah. especially if someone's bringing something to a tournament oh yeah, yeah. this is i mean a tournament they're all going to be nines and tens right you, they should be yeah this is all about like casual magic at a gp we just sit down and play or at, in your play group or whatever you know i think you're a little bit right about jank because i bet a like eight-year-old player could build a much better deck than a one to a two right yeah, like better as in more powerful more powerful yeah, yeah. All, has better cards honestly if you just took like yaruk and just threw a bunch of cards into it that's better it's than gonna be better than a one or a two you so. almost have to try to hit one or two but what if my deck i first built had zero ramp and was just so bad josh then it probably falls into the next category jimmy oh ah, well that's right because <laughs> when i first started playing this game i was a casual player three to four i was not making a podcast <laughs> Near full time, Josh definitely full time. <laughs> so casual cards are uh, casual decks are basically the decks that let's say you were just sitting around and you have six boxes of random cards and rares from the last three sets. You just throw the cards that match the color of the general, kind of like the Yarok deck that Josh has said. Although Yarok by itself may increase the power level of the deck, and usually it's not too much thought involved. Yeah, I'd say this is like your first deck. Yeah. This is like, you just learned about Commander, or hey, some people invited you to play tonight, and you usually play Limited or Standard, but they're playing Commander, so you just throw something yeah, together. Yeah, an hour, yeah. Yeah, and you're just like, they're the right colors, it's generally, so there's some creatures and some stuff, and here we go, we're gonna have fun. Uh, usually they have pretty bad mana curves as far as like a lot of high CMC stuff. Low synergy, maybe just a lot of singularly decent cards. Yeah, and the thing we always talk about, just no ramp or card draw, or not yep. enough of either. Like maybe they have the one soul ring they had, but didn't realize that you kind of got to get a little more than that. Yeah, they're not being like, I got exactly 10 ramp and 10 draw. They're like, yeah, a couple of signet, a soul ring, something yeah, else. That's yeah. fine, divination, it whatever. Was in the box. Yeah. Uh, low synergy a lot of times. Oh, I already said that. Low interaction is what I meant. Yeah. So 
a lot of like lower power decks just don't have the ability at all to interact with your opponent's decks and what they're doing and so you see that in casual three to four decks it's like Sh- bringing the wrong weapon to a fight yeah, it's or like I came with a club, but everyone's got guns. Okay, yeah. and this is bad for me. <laughs> uh, shaky mana bases, maybe a little bit. So that's definitely true because one of the things that I'd say takes the most time that really gets into the next category is you have to sit down, count all the pips out, be yes. like, when do I need what lands, and that's that can be the game sometimes, as I have clearly demonstrated in the past. <laughs> that can be the game, just straight up. Just not drawing the right lands or having a bad mana base. Yeah, just having uh, the wrong percentages. You've got way more red mana than you have percentage-wise red cards in your deck. True. And just not thinking about that kind of stuff. Um, oh, a, yeah. a lot of these casual decks or decks that fall into the three and four category are just trying to pull off hard sh- strategies or strategies that are tough to pull off. Like I put down Goat Tribal, right? Which is like, if you build a goat tribal deck, you could build the most powerful version of a goat tribal deck, but goat tribal is just not a very supported strategy in the history of Magic. And so that deck is unlikely to ever, no matter what you do, put in all the mana crypts and guys' cradles you want, (laughs) and it's still not going to be a 10 out of 10. It can only get to a certain level. Not all strategies are created equal. So hard to pull off strategy might just be something that's kind of a little bit, you know, it might even be like... It's got one foot in jank as far as like... In, the general interest that got you to build this casual deck, for sure. Yeah, it's like, ah, it's a deck, it's Goat Tribal, and I'm still trying to win games of Magic. You know, it's not like all miscut cards or something mm-hmm. like that. But at the same time, I know that like Dragon Tribal would just be straight up more powerful. But I think it's funny to do Goat Tribal. So it's a three or four on the I've power scale. I've noticed that even some like designers, people that pl- uh, work at Watsi oh, yeah. and stuff, this is kind of where they love to live in their spare time, which definitely gives a lot of credit to just how much fun Commander can be. Because you can live in this world and have a blast playing this game. Well, and also, like I think it makes sense from a game if you're a game designer. Like yeah. One of the things about the game that you like is not beating your opponents, but showing off the fact that like you're making connections that nobody is making. Yeah. And so designing your deck. Even though they end up in like, and I ping you for one. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Like, all right. Look how clever I was. Goldberg machine. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Oh yeah, this is a great point too. The early pre-cons uh, were not focused at all. Now the more recent ones out of the box have focus, have synergy, have great interaction. But the early ones were like sometimes just Animar plus two other commanders and all three of the decks are kind of in there. Yeah. Build I think your own. The first like three years of pre-cons, I would call them like threes or fours mm-hmm. uh, in, in this casual category because yeah, they were like one third of three different decks shuffled together. You know, not th- so fun to play against each other as a result. They were definitely not super, super power- powerful because they're so unfocused. Uh, uh, the early days of our format. Yeah, I also think a lot of times the, th- the the decks in this category, the threes and fours, they suffer from a lack of win cons sometimes. People didn't just get all the way to like, how do I win? It's, yeah. I'm building Goat Travel. Ha ha ha, it's going to be funny. But there's not like the final blow that what is my deck trying to build to that's going to eventually win the game. They're like, oh, I'll attack with some goats eventually and yeah. that'll probably get it done. Well, it's also the kind of deck like I would build, which is just like, I have an insurrection in here. It's like, well, you can't, that's not your win con. It, your win con needs to be something you build up to, right? And insurrection relies on a lot of things to be happening at the table to work. So n- that's casual, basically, okay? That's, uh, we'll move on to the next section, which is focus. And, and How many casual decks do you think you have? Only a couple. Side, yeah. yeah, I have like two probably. Yeah, I, I have like two. Because I would say even like, say the pre-cons from this year, which mm-hmm. we're going to talk about in a second are already stronger than threes and fours. Yeah. So it's difficult these days to have a super casual deck if it's not on purpose. I I have like one, just in case you run into those people who are like, you know, maybe they're like eight years old, they're Mm -hmm. they're very young and and new deck builders. Because I think, you know, like Jack Landis, who is... uh, we used to oh, talk yes. about all the time who's older than eight now. Sorry, Jack. Um, <laughs> but still very good at magic and getting better every time I see him. But if he builds a deck, it's going to be way above a three or a four. So even even then, like, it's hard to need a three or a four. But you, you do run into it sometimes. And sometimes people just have wacky decks and you want them to play those and you want to see them. Yeah. So if Bradley Rose has his, well, you're going to guess my uh, theme, theme deck. deck, then I want one bad deck. Quote, unquote, bad. Sorry. Um to be able to so that that game can happen right yeah because i don't want to be like well all i got is sevens and eights sorry you're just uh you're in trouble bradley and i'll say this much i've tried that a lot which is just like okay you guys are all fours and fives i have a seven but i'm gonna try and play it like a five it it's you just end up sitting there being like well i guess i could just put these cards in my deck because i'm not gonna it's just it's not a fun experience yeah. yeah so if you have a casual deck and you want to run it with casual decks that's what we suggest but in this next category this is probably the most flexible out of all of them and is i would say where the vast majority of commander decks actually lie yeah, I'd say six and seven. So we've, yeah, between we're between this and the next. Yeah, we're at five and six here. This is focused. Um, 
And it's interesting we call it focus because what do we say about the pre-cons from the early years? They're just unfocused, unfocused right? Yeah, low scatterbrained. Yeah. So focus decks at five and six, this is where you're starting to come together as a deck builder. These decks have focus plans and they basically know what they want to do and how they're going to win. Uh, not necessarily win the same way, but like yeah. I'm going to pump all my creatures, I'm going to attack, or I'm going to sacrifice all my creatures over and over, and that's going to attrition out my opponents. Or, and I've got the tools to do so. Yeah. Uh, there are still room for some quote-unquote bad cards in decks like these, sometimes for reasons of nostalgia. This is my favorite card, mm -hmm. and I just wanted to play it. Or this is a really fun card. Does it synergize perfectly with what my deck wants to do? No, but I've always wanted to play it, and every time I play it, I get a laugh. So yeah, fives and sixes can have some amount of those cards but they do generally have higher synergy than the th ones, twos, threes, and fours. They are trying for their cards to work together as, you know, to build up to something greater than the whole. Yeah, and I would say the synergy is probably the more important part because it means that in, I would say, again, the majority of decks out there right now are really focused, hyper-focused around what the commander does. Yeah. So if you're putting synergy into your deck, then you are focusing on what you need to really interact with your key card or how you're going to bridge out from there. So focus decks... That and well, interaction is also the other thing. Whereas, like, I now understand I need to protect my general or I need to get rid of that one. So, you're just generally also thinking more about what your game plan is. Not that the casual decks and the jank decks don't do that, but when you're a deck that's focused, I think it's also the point where you want your deck to be able to win. I think if you're a play, playing like three to a four, you don't go into a game with the expectation of like, I'm gonna take this thing down. You're like, I'm gonna do some cool stuff. Yeah, but yeah, five and sixes have start to that sort of like desire, I, th I think, within the design. Yeah, I like what you said there, too. I, I believe focus decks, fives and sixes, they start to have more interaction. They are worried about being able to stop what their opponents are doing sometimes. Yeah, I think board wipes is like the basic level of like, yep, you should put this in your deck. Uh, focus decks start to have decent mana curves. Maybe not ironclad, really worrying like, oh, I should take out a, a three drop so I can put in another two drop like some of the higher tiers that we're going to talk mm -hmm. about in a minute are very focused on that but in general they are worried about mana curve they will cut some of the higher cmc stuff to just be more efficient earlier in the game they're worried about some stuff like that um definitely running less tutors yeah definitely running less basically like get out of jail free cards is what i like to call tutors it's just like it's the card that you know you can find something to help you out and if you don't have that then your deck loses a lot of power um not to, if i'd say focus decks still probably will run one to two to three in that area Three is probably even on the higher side. So it's just not something you can consistently rely on to bring you wins. And a lot of times that's on purpose, right? A lot of people don't like uh, commander decks that sort of play out the same every time you mm -hmm. play them. And tutors are ways to go always guarantee you find certain cards. And the very, very, very powerful decks will usually win in the exact same way every single time, which some people like and some people don't like. We're not here to sort of judge yeah. what which is... Uh, which is more fun for you, but less tutors in general in fives and sixes is something you see a lot. Fives and sixes have better mana bases, but often are still sort of suboptimal, haven't quite ironed out all the kinks, and also maybe for budgetary reasons, maybe not, they don't necessarily have every shock and fetch that they need. They don't have, you know, the perfect mana base as it were. And we're not talking about dual lands, although those are awesome. Uh, but just even within what is more obtainable for most players, sometimes there'll be some little holes with like, ah, oh, you really could use an Arid Mesa in there. Yeah. And you'll see in general that this trend follows, uh, for the land bases, what's being reprinted in standard. Yeah. So you're going to see oh. a lot more shock lands right now. You're going to see the distant cons of Tarkir fetch land still. And then you can almost gauge when the player entered the game if they're just playing from histories and years of it when, they're, when their lands basically start entering their decks because they often are the most expensive part of the deck. And then again, in fives and sixes, in focus decks, it might just be because... They, I mean, they might be five and a six and not a seven or an eight mm -hmm. because they've chosen to follow or go after what I would consider a weaker strategy. And again, Less reliable to win the game. So yeah, when, when we say weaker, I don't mean to be disparaging about it. I just mean like looking at it outside, unbiased, it is just less powerful than yeah. some of the other strategies. Butter so, Knife Samurai Sword. Yeah, so... One's Vol really good at cutting butter, though. <laughs> so Voltron strategies, mill strategies, group hug strategies. Not that those can't be fun and can't win games. They certainly can. But in general, they're not as powerful as some of the other strategies. So that may be holding the deck into yeah. a five and a six on the power scale because, again, not all strategies are created equal. You might be playing Boros. It's very hard for a Boros deck to push up into the nines and tens. It's just the way that it is because they haven't created the cards 
games to give people the tools to really get there on the competitive side. So yeah, and that, if you play, and so and the reason that these are also in general weaker is because there are other decks that are popular that just counter it straight up. Yeah, like a Stasis deck versus Voltron is very difficult to get around, or an Aristocrats deck with great packs and stuff. Yeah, um, mill like mil strategy can just be completely hosed by like an Ulamog and a Kozilek in yeah. your deck. Like, yeah, exactly. It just becomes very very tough. Uh, wanted to say that the recent pre-cons, so we're talking like the last three years or f ever since C16, I'd say, yeah. uh, those are mostly fives, I'd say. These days, they're making the pre-cons a lot more powerful than they used to. They probably started out as threes. Some power creeping up to like a 5.56 almost. I hope they don't go any higher because it doesn't leave you a ton of places to go because a yeah. lot of players don't even want to build a deck ever that's a nine or above. So like if you start at a six, then you only got two little notches to go. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I would say like this year's almost all the decks are right at about a five or maybe like a four and a half for the for the um, what was the one that I thought was the weakest? The uh, Anya deck. Oh, yeah. Anya deck. Yeah. yeah. Even though the, the card is great. And that deck is actually still pretty good. Yeah. OK, so we are going to continue. We've got Optimize, which are seven eights, competitives, nines and tens to go. And but, a little more discussion, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And some other. Well. Yeah, looking at the notes, there's quite a bit to go, so <laughs> stay tuned, but we're going to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. Hey everyone, this week's episode is brought to you in part by Audible, one of the top leading digital providers of audiobooks. That's right, Audible is the best way for you to consume and learn from over 100,000 titles. The service is super simple. Your first month is 100% free and you get to listen to an audiobook immediately. So right now, I've been enjoying Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. Brene Brown is the author of like five New York Times bestselling books and she has that TED Talk with mm -hmm. over 30 million views. Dare to Lead is really fantastic. It's very no-nonsense and offers up some incredible insights on how to cultivate bravery over fear, step up in tough situations, and learn to lead. You know, one of the main reasons we've been able to take the command zone to where we are today, outside of obviously tons of hard work, is that it also takes a lot of leadership and initiative to manage our ever-growing team and try and consistently put out the best content we can. Yeah, that sounds really valuable. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to check that book out myself. And if you out there want to check out all the books on Audible, and they have tons over every single genre, just go to audible.com slash command or text the word command to 500 500 to sign up today and let us know what you end up reading we are always down for a good book recommendation again that's audible.com slash command or text the word command to 500 500 to get started so a little while back we had a promotional call out for me undies and jimmy you got pretty excited yes because i legitimately love them and i've been wearing them for literal years me undies i swear and and i'm just so glad that we actually got sponsored too it's perfect uh all this was news to me which i guess makes sense because you know underwear is not something people talk about a lot yeah but it was really fun because after we did the spot obviously everyone had to talk about me undies for a little bit and it turns out there were other people in the office that are like yes i wear them they're great yeah and that's what i was gonna say after hearing y'all sing the praises so much of MeUndies, I felt like I kind of had to try it out myself. And? And you were totally right. Woohoo! They're super, super soft. I tried out just one pair and then basically immediately signed up for the membership service, which means I'm going to get new undies delivered to my door every single month. That's comfort and convenience. I told you they're awesome. And right now, MeUndies is running a promotion for all of our listeners. All you got to do is go to MeUndies.com slash command and first-time purchasers get 15% off and free shipping. Plus, they have a 100% satisfaction guarantee policy, so it's basically no risk. Again, go to MeUndies.com slash command. Trust us, you won't regret it. All right. Okay, moving on. Now it's time to get laser focused, Josh. And when you get laser focused, you become optimized. Optimus Prime. <laughs> Autobots, <laughs> let's roll out. Um, so now we are getting into decks that are, I would consider, just, you could call them powerful. These it, are sevens and eights. Yeah. It, you know, in a way, like, I'm not trying to say, like, if you have a focus deck, you're only going to win five or six, a tad of ten times in the game. But I think once you get towards the higher level, that's sort of the idea, is that you're making a deck that wants to win seven or eight to out of ten times if it's really on the higher level. It's very, very hard, by the way. But it's like your intention going into it, knowing that you have a very low chance. <laughs> Comparatively, it's not like a 50-50 split. I mean, I would say a sevens and eights they can have a chance to win against any deck. Mm -hmm. So you can bring 10s to the table and it's, listen, they won't be advantaged. They'll be yeah. disadvantaged for sure, but they have a chance in those games. Whereas below that, 10s might just be too powerful for most sixes to handle. Right. Like no matter what almost happens. Uh, short of like all your other opponents going after each other and you just sit there and nobody pays attention to you and then you finish <laughs> them off at the end. But like That's in general, the, win. <laughs> yeah, in general, the 
the power level does matter. Your play skill can't overcome a certain number of tier difference. Yeah, and a huge marker of what makes the decks from 7 to 10 uh, good is their ability to create a quick and good board state that can win the game or just create advantage very efficiently. And so that means very efficient mana curves. We're talking, I mean, the ones, twos, three drop slots are healthy and they are filled with ramp as well and things that are gonna help the mana curve so that they can ramp or just get to what they need or draw what they need into. This is where the decks very often play multiple things in the first couple of turns, whereas at five sixes and definitely lower, often it's just like land pass, land pass, land pass. Right. You know, you're getting to turn three before anything happens. Very rare with sevens and eights. They're they're very efficient mana curves. They're just faster decks. Uh, there's less or no room for what we call the bad cards in the focus category, the card that's just there for nostalgia or fun. It's very hard to have uh, an eight for sure that has more than a card or two that falls in that category. Yeah, you can fit in one or two that's fun, but in general, it's going to depower your deck too much to have a bunch of like stuff that doesn't synergize with everything else, and it's just like a cool card I like. Yeah, it's like take one ramp card out versus that, and if you again play like 100 games with this deck, that ramp card is going to help you out an insane amount more than the jank card is. So that actually, it's a larger chunk of value than you might realize. Uh, sevens and eights have optimal mana bases. They're, they've really paid attention to exactly the colors percentage wise of every card in their deck made sure that all of their lands and other mana producing sources are in cahoots with what those percentages are they have also thought about things like how many lands do I have that might come into play tapped. I want mm -hmm. a lot to come into play untapped. They're worried about things like playing my fourth land comes into play tapped. They don't want to do that at all. Yeah, and those decks also generally, their lands synergize with their deck too. So in your Tim deck, you have untappers and you have things to make your land super powered. So that's a mana base that also has that in mind. Like sometimes I can do X, Y, and Z with my mana base. And if that happens, I have my, you know, I have my cards that can transmute yeah. you know, to Larry West and get out of there and, and tutor something else up. Speaking of tutors... More tutors, obviously, yeah. and the best tutors, usually. So we're talking Demonic Tutor is probably the hallmark of any 7 or 8 deck. If you are playing black and don't have that card in there, I wouldn't... I would be like, I'm interested to see why you think this is 7 and 8. I think it could still be. It would depend on all the other cards in your deck. But in general, like, you're going to have the Mystic Tutors, the Enlightened Tutors. Whatever colors you're in, you're going to have the really good tutors. Yeah. And the cards that are arguably the 7 to 10 power levels cards of those colors. Tutors are so sense. powerful because they put multiple copies of your best cards in your deck and make sure that you can find the stuff when you need it. So I mm -hmm. think number of tutors and how good those tutors are is a pretty good indication of how powerful your deck is. Um, tons of synergy in the sevens and eights, really high interaction. Most sevens and eights are frequently able to reach out and stop what's going on from their opponent. They're you know, they don't have unlimited amount of that stuff, but very rarely will just like one move win the game right. against a seven and eight. They can stop one or two. They can parry a couple blows. And then they might run out of resources, not have enough card draw. Something could happen where you can overcome it, but you're rarely going to be like, I play this creature. It just sticks around for four rotations of the table and I win off of it against yeah. a seven or an eight. Oftentimes these decks will also build in their synergy the ability to interact really well. So you have your cards that you can either flicker at instant speed and have them do something like the Dead Eye Navigator sort of effects, or you have counter on a stick right things like that and tutors play into this too when you're playing more tutors the tutor allows you to go find an answer if that's what you need or a yeah. win con if that's what you need and so that kind of plays into it um and we've we've covered this in most of the the other categories but it it holds true here sevens and eights are usually playing the more powerful strategies so mm -hmm. they're not playing the strategies that are naturally weaker like we said voltron mill group hug that kind of stuff is just harder to pull off at a very high power level mm -hmm. you know Optimized decks, sevens and eights are playing value-based stuff, attrition-based stuff, Marins and stuff like that. Big mana decks, decks that are trying to cheat out huge, crazy things very, very early. This is stasis cards that stop other players from trying to affect you at all. Yeah, protect. that's stacks. I would even I would put that in probably nines and tens too. Uh, yeah. But but those type of decks, the very powerful strategies, are just naturally easier to build as a seven or eight because even a bad version of a really va high value-based attrition deck is probably going to be better than you know, a lot of Voltron decks, let's say. Just, and I say better by mean more powerful. Doesn't mean better, sorry. Well, I mean, you take two Voltron, a Voltron deck and a, Yar just again, Yarok is such a good comparison. Yeah. And Yarok deck, you build them with the same mana bases, power level and all that stuff. The Yarok deck will just generally win. Yeah, it'll that just be stronger. Up. Yeah. Yeah, not all commanders, colors, strategies are created equal. That's just the 
facts of the matter here. Yeah. I really like this next one, and it's one I didn't really think about, about sevens and eights, but the social contract is definitely still adhered to. And we're talking about the plays that make your opponents very salty. So Armageddon, blowing up everyone's land, or locking everyone out of the game so they can't do anything, or consistently casting something on turn three that wins you the game. Instant win cons. Yeah, com- tutoring for your combo piece on turn four. Sevens and eights usually aren't built to do those type of things. And that's kind of the biggest difference, I would say, between a 7-8 and a 9-10 is what the pilot and the deck builder will allow their deck to do. Not mm-hmm. that they couldn't just put in the second part of the combo. They just choose not to because they want to adhere to the social contract. Yeah. They want to open themselves up to playing against five sixes and maybe even like fours with their sevens and eights by not having like super huge blowout potential really early. Yeah. Now, they may still have the potential in their deck. They may just draw it into it, but it's not, again, what the deck is built to do. Yeah, it's not trying to get there as fast as possible, right? Uh, And this is where we start hitting what I would consider to be the most powerful possible point for many commanders and strategies. So, like, a Voltron deck. I keep going... I'm sorry. You guys know I have a thing about Voltron. and I I have one Voltron deck, and I'm so angry at you, Josh. Yeah, I have two Voltron decks, which is funny. (laughs) And they're, and they're fun, and I like them. But the truth of the matter is that it's very difficult to even build a Voltron deck that is an eight. Yeah. It just is. They're a strategy Unless that's... you have some other win con hidden in there, but the Voltron win con itself is just too vulnerable a lot of times. to, And not just win one, against one person, but the whole table. Take down the game, right. Yeah. yeah. Because it is easy to combat that, because everybody's ready for creatures attacking you. Yeah. So... That what I'm saying here is that you're starting to hit at sevens and eights for a lot of decks. That's just as powerful as it can get. Yeah. So imagine if, if any of you are like boxing out there, I think that's always a punching above your weight. What that means is a Voltron deck may its existence may be like a five or six on the power level in terms of in comparison to everything else, but it can pack a punch, but that punch isn't going to be big as another type of strategy. And it may punch all the way to an eight if it really masters it and efficient makes it, it trains the best, you know, whatever you want comparison you want to make, but it doesn't necess- it can't clock someone that's a little higher than that. It just can't ever be a 10, right? Like that's, I don't, I don't think a Voltron deck really can ever hit nine or 10 it can and if you look at the tier list from people from cedh you'll see that there's just no voltron there's no there's no group hug up there either there's a lot of strategies that just if you're if you've chosen that strategy the highest you can get are sevens and eights which is fine that's where a lot of us jimmy and i that's where we like to play too we purposely don't really go into the 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 next category here which we're going to talk about in a second um what was i going to say here oh so my example was a maxed out sram Mm mm-hmm a SRAM deck built as good as a SRAM deck can be built with the most powerful cards that can ever go in a SRAM deck. A mono white deck. Might be like a seven or an eight, somewhere in there. And then somebody else might build a Moldrotha deck, which would be considered like an, you know, um, a mediocre version of Moldrotha, which mm-hmm. also might be a seven or eight. And that's just the way that it goes because Moldrotha is just a more powerful commander than SRAM. I'm sorry. And access to three colors yep. that all do very good things in commander as opposed to one that we all lament about. And like we've, we keep bringing up Yaruk, I think it's actually almost, I mean, it's very, very difficult. You would have to try hard to make Yaruk. Yeah, you'd Yar- have to purposely try and like get rid of cards more than anything else. Yeah, to make Yaruk like a five. Yeah. It's just hard to do. Yaruk, just by its very nature, is going to be a six or seven most of the time if you're just putting in cards that say when this creature enters the battlefield, X. Okay. Good old panharmonicon effect. Oh, it's time. It's We've time. reached the end of our training. It's like at the end of like Avatar The Last Airbender. Spoiler alert, he is Avatar The Last Airbender. It's literally <laughs> <Spoiler> about him. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, if you couldn't guess what the end result of that show is, then I don't know. I mean, that's why I watched it. I couldn't yeah. wait for it to happen. So yeah, we are at full Avatar level with, the, with this last category of competitive nines to tens. So yeah, this is the tip top. It's the tip top. It's what we like to usually call CEDH or competitive EDH. So these decks are using only the most powerful commanders and strategies. Like I said, there's no Voltron decks up there. There's no Mill decks up there in the nines and tens. We're talking combo. Almost all of them are combo or have a combo. Have some combo aspect, yeah. Storm. Uh, and Which is in a way combo. <laughs> yeah. And stacks. I think stacks is the non-combo uh, strategy that can make it up there. Con- there's some maybe what you'd probably call control, which usually have stacks elements in there. Yeah. These, oh, I was also going to say another card to talk about in terms of interaction in general is how good is your counterspell? Yes. 
Because once you get into the force of will territories, it obviously is in the competitive realm. So yeah, although I'm going to talk about, or we're going to talk about that in a little. I don't know. You could have a force of will in a in a f- sure. five or six. We'll talk about that in a second. But they're more likely to be played in the nines and tens. So the the competitive players have chosen the most powerful strategies on purpose because they know which ones are the good ones, and they're just trying to win. And they have hyper efficient and laser focused decks that are trying to do the thing that's going to win as fast as possible. One of the things we see often in competitive decks is like lower land counts, super high ramp counts. So yeah. like 30 lands, 25 ramp cards. They're and playing the moxes and the legal moxes and, and the mana vaults and the mana crypts and the everything that costs one or two mana that can give you more mana as fast as possible because they're going to try and win super early. Yeah, and in general, the only time you'll see very high-costed cards are if they can be cheated out through some sort of effect, or if there's a way to, like, like if it's inexpropriate, it's like, I just need to get nine mana. And well, these decks might be able to get there by turn three or four. Yeah, these decks are just designed to execute win condition as fast as possible. And in general, CEDH decks, nines and tens, they ignore the social contact track. They don't they don't care about it. And that's known among the competitive players. No one's getting mad if you do Armageddon or if you yeah. if you stasis lock everybody. That's what's expected. We're all just trying to win the game. Yeah. And it I would say CEDH has its own social contract that is, I bet, a lot more bare bones if you had to write it out, which is just like play courteously is probably on there instead of don't try and blow up people's lands. Yeah, they're not worried if I if what I'm doing stops other players from playing. That's what everybody signed up for, is yeah. to just try and win. Um not all commanders and strategies can even become a competitive deck. You can't just take any legendary creature from the history of magic and say, I'm going to make this into a nine or a 10. Some yeah, can't ever happen. get there. Uh, very few, I think, can ever reach 10. A lot can reach nine. Like any five color deck can reach mm-hmm. nine out of 10, probably. Some, a lot of them can go into the 10 category uh, just because... You can build a deck without the commander with five colors. Yes, yeah. exactly. You can have win cons and everything else and enough tutors to to just have the same shell of 99 cards with any five color deck that will be like maybe a nine out of 10. Um, yeah, I mean, competitive is easy to explain, right? Like, <laughs> It's really easy. It's basically like you want to win as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, and you want to stop other pl- players from doing it. Yep. If all of these decks are like your your samurai sword, and uh, again, when two samurai fought, or like, you know, they would try and kill each other as fast as possible with right. the cleanest cut, single cut. It was like, it was a part of the art and, I guess, culture of it. So if you're a competitive deck, you're basically trying to sit there and see, can I, who's going to draw faster? Or who's going to make the crucial parry and then slice? Right. And you're doing this with three players around the table. So I understand the thrill of it. Yet I still have no interest. <laughs> I mean, it can be fun. I don't like it all the time, but certainly I can, I like can a game him, here and there, I, yeah. I do like it. Yeah. I'm all in the club of, let me borrow that deck and see what I can do. I've done that a few times now, and it's fun to just sort of unload. Yeah, and and people love it, and they're not like me. They like to do it all the time, and that's great. Yeah. Uh, as long as everybody knows what they're getting into, right? So I wanted to notice something. So we're done going through the categories. That's one through 10, but you probably still have some questions and we're going to try and... Uh, cover them as Cover them here, yeah. If not, send an email with the words question time at the top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just because we're not giving away anything away, you can still ask us questions. Yeah, it's a good way to know it's a question, by the way. So let's talk about something we did not mention when going through all the categories. Well, you kind of touched on it, Jimmy, so maybe we're going to have a slight difference of opinion. But oh, let's some, go. Something ding, we did ding, ding. not mention was specific cards. So I don't think this is about specific cards. I hear people say weird stuff like, he said his deck was a seven, but then he opened up with Underground Sea and Mana Crypt. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean anything. Just because somebody plays a Mana Crypt in their deck doesn't automatically bump their deck to an eight on the power scale. Sure, they could have just opened it in a draft. It doesn't even have to do with that. To me, not all commanders, colors, and strategies are created equal. So sometimes they're playing Goat Tribal, and the only way that their Goat Tribal can even be a five or six on the power level is by putting Mana Crypts and things in it, because they're just trying to be like, hey, I want my Goat Tribal deck to at least be able to hang with most decks. Right. So this is an underpowered strategy. I'm going to put Guy's Cradle and Mana Crypt in there, but that doesn't make it an eight out of 10. It makes it a six out of 10. Yeah, I think the the way that I see it is that I think a natural instinct of a lot of Magic players is to just, if you're building, if you can only build, let's say, three decks, you're just going to put your best cards into those decks, even if the rest of the shell around it might not work. So the, I do often see like the, hey, wow, that nice underground seed, nice moxin, not mox, the legal moxins or whatever it is, and you go, oh, how powerful really is your deck? And you quickly find out that it's just a few shiny nuggets amongst a, a, a pile that may not be as strong as those cards indicate. I mean, if you're playing a Voltron deck and you put Mana Crypt out there, I understand. Right. You're just trying to push it up to the, to a 7 or an 8 somehow. 
And that totally makes sense to me. And if you said, hey, my deck's an eight and you play a mana crypt, I'm not going to say like, oh, it's competitive all of a sudden. Yeah, I think the only thing is I would say you are allowed to be at least a little wary if someone starts playing high power level. And again, I think the thing, the, one of the big key differentiators here is also like high cost level cards because it, I think, I think what the players assume is that it also says something about the player, that they are willing to invest X amount into this to have these cards on the table for whatever reason. And maybe it's not always a personal story of like, oh, I got this from my brother or I, I inherited this card and then this card I got traded, I traded a bunch for. So it's very interesting. I think, honestly, the conversation does make a big difference. And if you are that player that has those like three or four like, whoa, 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 dang, wait, what power level is your deck? cards you should probably also learn that it will help to clarify that because this first impression is hard to beat sometimes even if you can sit there and like logic your way through it with the other players uh, yeah and I, I think like listen you're allowed to be wary or think whatever you want when anybody does anything like <laughs> nobody can tell you not to think like oh that's a mana crypt and it's it's you know, he lied to us, but I don't think that that's actually a fair most of the time. I would disagree that like you see a mana crypt and you just automatically bump his or her deck up two rungs in your in your mind a lot of times i don't think Maybe that's probably two true. rungs i would give it like a point three to point i hear four. people be like he Bump. said he was a seven then he played mana crypt you know cedh Wait, players you know seven, seven definitely plays mana crypt too that yeah. might be the other thing too is that players don't have like uh, like you said you can't put it into a computer and get an average so a mana crypt actually has a variability it can be in a like josh said a jank deck a two all the way up to a ten i just think you're much much more likely to see it in the vast majority of like the seven to eight to nine to ten decks yeah, maybe sevens and eights, I would agree. Yeah. But I think there are... Unless you're super serious about your, your jank, which I, again, applaud you for. But the, those decks, I think, just are scarcer in nature. I think there are players that do build, like we said, Wizards of the Coast people. Mm -hmm. uh, I talked about Bradley and his deck. Oh, where popular trying players to as well, guess too. the theme or whatever. Decks, yeah. yeah, that are very invested players. They listen to all the content and they buy a lot of cards, but they're just purposely not pushing their power levels up into the realms that we're talking about, nines and tens. And so they might have force of will in a deck that is actually a seven or an eight. The force of will doesn't make your deck a nine or a 10 just by itself. You know, it takes a lot of different cards working all towards the same goal to push you there. So, well, yeah, maybe looking at the opposite helps too, which you wrote here. Like if you, your high powered Urza deck doesn't have a mana crypt, it doesn't drop it two levels. Yeah, that's, so. that's something I think I see a lot too, which people go, no, I, they pull out their Urza deck and everybody goes, oh, Urza. <laughs> and they're like, and they're like no, 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 no. It's, it's an underpowered Urza. It's like an eight. It's not a 10. And what in their mind, they're like, yeah, my Urza deck doesn't have a mana crypt. Listen, lack of mana crypt also does not push down your deck by two numbers, right? Just because your Urza deck doesn't have a mana crypt doesn't mean it's an eight all of a sudden. That's yeah. just not how that works. It may be helpful to when you do look at your deck and try to accurately determine its power level, just be as honest with yourself as possible. Because if you're also in Urza player and like it doesn't have mana crypt, it's just got a bunch of other one drop rocks and stuff. <laughs> it's like, all right, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It, I mean, a lot of it depends on what the commander is, what the deck's trying to do, yeah. and individual cards two one two three four even that you can think of that you wish you had that you don't don't actually increase or decrease the power of your deck by that much yeah it wouldn't push it from a seven to an eight it's, it's not hard, about yeah. three or four cards it might be if it's tutors that's the one thing i would say the difference between two yeah. tutors and seven tutors is big and some ramp yeah like flash like ramp like mana crypt again we keep saying it but it is a zero cost card that gives you a ton of value but you have to draw it yeah. So yeah. any one card that you just have to draw for it to do its thing is going to only bump your power level by so much. Um, okay. Let's talk about a, a useful quantifiable metric here. So a lot of what we're talking about is you've got to do all these calculations in your head and it's a I little think bit it's of chemistry. Like around this. Yeah. yeah. Which is, again, it's going to be more art than science. So you're always going to have to do that a little. But maybe yeah. we can help you out a little bit here. Paint with care. So the question I think to ask here that will give you sort of a good guesstimate of what your deck's power level is, or at least good starting point is what turn can the deck consistently threaten to win? Yes, not win outright, but threaten to win. So right. it's usually like the punch is wound up, it's ready to deliver, and you may not see it necessarily, but the deck is able to do that if, an, if an nobody interacts with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the two words that are really important are consistent, so it's not like with the nut draw, with the best possible draw, my deck can win on turn two sometimes. It yeah. doesn't make your deck a nine out of 10 or, all, or a 10 out of 10. It's, oh, most games my deck on turn three is ready to win. Okay, mm -hmm. now you're a, you're a nine or a 10, right? Threaten is like you said, just the ability not actually doing it. It doesn't have to do with whether you're fighting through a removal or anything like that. Yeah, and we're also not talking about just the god hand. So you have to get these exact seven cards and the next two cards in your library need to be X and, you know, like we're not talking about those either. 
Uh, and this, this, what we're about to say, doesn't necessarily work for every single power level or type of strategy, but it'll work for a lot. So in general, well, we'll see if you agree. I wrote this down. So it seems right. 10 out of 10s can win the game anywhere from turn four or before. They threaten to win. Mm-hmm. So they can just have a turn one turn that shows up and you look at Flash it. Flash Hulk. There, is, there are, yeah, there are three things there that may go infinite kind of thing. But in general, they're consistent, like by turn four, Mm -hmm. most of the time, if I'm uninterrupted, my deck is in a position where I can win the game. Nines are more like turn five or six. Yeah, I would even say maybe four to six because it's hard to some put a whole turn. Yeah, but especially because we've already grouped the nines and the tens together as quote unquote competitive. I think nine and 10 differences might just be like, actually, do you think the difference between a nine and a 10 is the same as between a seven and an eight? probably like a sevens and eights are fairly close and one has a good chance to beat the other like they're and i think nines and tens are the same whereas like definitely mm-hmm. like they're slightly disadvantaged but it's not by so much because a lot of the you know mizix is an uh, built at its top is probably like a nine right and definitely not as powerful as the most powerful urza deck but can it beat an urza deck sometimes yeah for sure yeah 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 for sure so yeah and i would say yeah okay fine four to six maybe is a nine out of ten it's uh, art <laughs> somewhere in there Eights are somewhere between turn seven and nine, uninterrupted. They could probably win the game or end mm-hmm. the game. Sevens are somewhere between between turn ten and twelve, probably. And that's where we see most games on like game nights and extra turns and things end is somewhere around turn eleven, twelve, ten. And we don't mean like the game actually ends at that point necessarily. Sometimes it's the game's wrapped up at that point. Yeah, there's going to be one, one and a half more rotations at the yeah, table. But, but the game has essentially ended. Right. We know 11. who's going to win and there's almost nothing that can happen. Yeah. You know, like uh, the Amaz game with Yarok where it was like, it took him two more turns, but he had wrapped up that game yeah, on like with turn the 10. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the things that confuses a lot of players when they say like my deck's an eight is that they don't realize that that does mean that you can win by turn nine yeah right so like you can consistently again threaten to win so it's not just like sometimes i drew all my rocks it's like no you your deck was built to make sure you could ramp that out at that point uh and then if you're at a six power level or below you can probably win you know most games you're set up by like turn 13 plus Mm -hmm. like on average not that sometimes you don't get a good draw and you can win on turn 11 it's just your average case is 13 plus and i think like after turn 13 it kind of becomes pointless to track it right because most decks given that amount of time with no interruption can win even the jank decks can just cast enough you know yeah janky creatures or whatever to to still muster up a win around turn 14 yeah the only difference would be after turn 13 i would say the decks that are nines and ten actually seven through tens have a much higher chance of winning sooner than the other decks because they'll have the resilience the card draw the advantage the synergy the setups the all the other things that make them what they are and i would say that stacks decks and control decks uh can be nines and tens without being able to win on those turns because a stack yeah. decks it, and maybe a stack decks you could say this same sort of thing we said with the other ones which is the turn they win is actually four or five turns after the game actually ends or before the game actually ends because so maybe they created the lock or whatever it yeah is, maybe yeah. they lock the table out on turn five or six and then they actually win way down the line i think what they also do is they make like the other t- you know a, a 10 out of 10 deck is playing a stack stack and it makes that deck not win on turn three, but threaten to win on turn six. And now all right. of a sudden the stacks that can win because it just pushed their ability to win early down the line. Yeah. Uh, it like slotted itself into the, the assembly line before it got there. Yeah. So it doesn't, this, this uh, idea doesn't really work with stacks and control decks as well, but that's, I think a good starting point. So let's go over it one more time. If your power level 10 turns one to four, power level nine turns four to six. Power level eight turns seven to nine. Power level seven turns 10 to 12. And power level six or below, somewhere after turn 13 mm-hmm. uh, is when you probably can consistently threaten to win. Notice yeah. the vast majority of decks, I'd say 80. I'm just making up. I would say 80. I was going to say 80. 80, 75, 80% of all decks sit between six and eight on the power scale. Yep. That's just what you see out in the wild the most. Yeah, and in general, that's what you're going to encounter at GPs, conventions, Magic Fests, sorry. Uh, Another big important thing, again, we are not talking about your ability to play or politic, but I will say your ability to politic, it, it starts to affect the power level of your deck overall 
uh, and being able it to affects win your win chance, it your win chance, yeah, not the power level. Sorry, yeah. sorry, the win chance starting at around sevens and sixes because at that point you're able to move the game enough, maybe with your words. Whereas I think the tens and the nines, there's no politicking. Yeah, yeah, it's, I, it's kill or be killed in a lot of situations. I'd say sevens and eights politics matters, but nine and ten they just don't politic much at competitive decks. Uh, they do a little sometimes, but which in, is probably pretty fun to watch too. I'm sure. Yeah, but in general, like. You can't politic that much when they're just like, no, but I win now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what if uh, you gave me one turn? <laughs> just a proposition. Yeah, you can't give any 9 or 10 an extra turn. They're very <laughs> likely to win on that turn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Huge percent. Uh, another factor I would consider now when ranking the decks is how fragile slash resilient the deck is. So I might dock a deck some points if like, you just know, I build this deck, I'm going to play it, but if one board wipe happens in this game... It's over. Yeah, my deck's basically done. Well, that's a thing that's likely to happen in a lot of games. So if my deck can threaten to win on turn 7 to 9, which would make it an 8 on the power scale, mm -hmm. but one board wipe makes it almost impossible to win, then I wouldn't call that deck an 8. Yeah, or from the bevy of answers and colors that are available to find them, the ways to beat this deck just happen to be higher in yeah. this regard. Just one board by whatever it is and that's why again voltron sorry to keep poo pooing all over it <laughs> since one creature I don't know, edict effects oh yeah. gosh <laughs> steal it oh no <laughs> so that's where the art and science comes in it's like you take your thing you look at what turn it can probably consistently threaten to win on you look yeah. at the other factors you say my deck somewhere around a seven or an eight and then you look at the resilience factor and then let me just say the smart thing to do here is to understand that you're a human and there's a tendency to want to underrate your deck to slightly misrepresent it, even if you're an honest person. And so I would go yeah, I would never go into a room if I was like, yeah, I'm repping the strongest deck at the table. Come at me. I'm like, that's nah, not a good idea <laughs> to start the game. I would say in general, people undershoot what their deck's power level is rather than overshoot it. Rarely will a person say their deck's an eight if it's really a seven, but often yeah. people will say their deck's a six if it's really a seven. Yeah, and this can happen subconsciously too. Yeah. Like you could just think about your deck like, well, I don't win that much. So this has influenced my decision about what I actually think this deck is at. And also, you know all the weaknesses of your deck. Well, if right. they just remove my commander or well, they just blow up my mana rock well then the whole thing falls apart and but yeah. your opponents don't know all those things so they're unlikely to always do those things so, so that strategy don't don't tell them if they don't know well definitely don't tell them but i would also say when you're ranking your deck in your mind if you're any way on the fence at all just bump it up a little bit mm -hmm. represent it in the other way and you can feel good when you win games where I, I thought my deck was a six but i said it was a seven and then i still won that game so that feels way better than i thought my deck was a seven but i said it was a six and i still won that game and i got him yeah i couldn't see it coming yeah all right, uh, some closing thoughts here. Remember, the scaling system is not meant to put all decks at, uh, in any given game at the same power level. We're not trying to equalize exactly. So you don't want to have all sevens yeah. necessarily. That'd be great, but you don't. that's not the goal of it. The goal is just to not have a nine against a four in the same pod. Use your time efficiently, use it to the best, and do it in a way that you think is going to engender the best playing experience for yourself. And if that so happens to include everyone else at the table, then I hope everyone has a blast. I hope we have big laughs and big plays and all that stuff. Yeah, don't pub stomp, but also be aware that you don't want to get pub stomped. And that's really what this is trying to do. It's yeah. just not trying to make it exactly even, just close. Yeah. Uh, and don't be afraid to give people a break if they mess up. I've messed up before. I've I've done the thing where I overrate my power. I'm like, this is definitely an eight. I play it, I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this 10 drop doing in my hand? So people will make mistakes. We're all human. Um, and it's just one of those things too that it takes time, like anything else, to practice to sort of understand these facts. Even us just saying it here, Josh and I are still very liable to make a mistake about the power of a level or deck for something that we haven't foreseen before. So don't feel bad and don't make others feel bad either. Yeah, I like that you know, don't judge people too harshly based, especially based on like one game. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing, like, especially after GP Vegas or online, we hear about, oh, I went to the store, I played a GP and the guy said his Sucks, deck was a seven, yeah. then he played a mana crypt and then he killed us all and blah, blah, blah. It's one game. He could have got the nut draw. You don't even know. Just give people a break. Don't judge them too harshly. Now, that being said, if it's a pattern of behavior that you notice over a long period of time, that's a different thing. They consistently threaten to underrepresent the power level of their deck, you mean? Well, if they <laughs> consistently actually do it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but, in other, but otherwise, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt. One game doesn't give you enough data points to really be able to judge much. Yeah, exactly. All right. That's going to wrap it up, I think, for our discussion here. There's a lot to digest, and it is the 
the tip of the iceberg, I think, when it comes to this sort of stuff. Because again, as Magic develops, more cards are going to come out, more things are going to happen, more changes are going to happen to the format, ban lists and all that stuff. There are always going to be shifts. And so this discussion is not over yet. So that is our question to you on the end step here. Or, or not the end step, sorry, uh, to the listeners. Where we talk to the listeners, not to the end step. The end step is an inanimate thing. The end step's in a minute. Yeah, <laughs> it's in a minute. So let us know what you think are uh, your own power level rankings, if there's anything we've forgotten, or if you have a drastically different way of ranking them, which I would be interested to see. Maybe someone has like a letter grading system. That'd be good, good to know. Yeah, if you have any other quantifiable ways that you kind of decide what the power ranking is that can help other people out, comments are always a great place for that. Now, if you want to pick up any cards to either power up or power down your decks, the best place to go is cardkingdom.com slash command zone. Use that affiliate link when you're ordering your magic products, singles, anything at all. You really are helping this show, game nights, extra turns, all of our content. You really are going to buy magic cards no matter what we say or do. We know that. <laughs> so you, we do too. Yeah. We are just so, like you. So you may as well, while you're getting the magic cards you want, simultaneously support all the contents that content that you watch i'm gonna get a foil craw worm so i can play it and have people be in like, your yeah, deck my, my, yeah but it's really nine <laughs> just with one craw worm somehow i found the slot uh, <laughs> I, I would say that one of the great ways people ask us that's related to this uh people ask us how do i power down my decks mm -hmm. my decks are too powerful one of the best ways take the tutors out yeah and then you got to replace those with other cards at cardkingdom.com slash commando easy <laughs> and if you want to play your very powerful deck on a uh, play mat that indicates how powerful it is like this awesome liliana and stuff ultra pro has been making playmats from magic art for many many years now they are the top of the line when it comes to it as well as other products that help store your cards singles you got sleeves they got top loaders they got all sorts of ways to display your cards as well so make sure you also pick up some ultra pro product when you're at card kingdom or at your local game store or at your big box retailer it's all there uh, and lastly, don't forget our Kickstarter, there's only a couple of weeks left, is going on right now. It's to help us make some much needed upgrades uh, around the office so that we can continue to make game nights better, make more episodes of extra turns. There's a gag reel for game nights that mm -hmm. uh, we've hit that stretch goal already. So it's you amazing. are going to see it at some point, but we've got more stretch goals and awesome rewards. Kickstarter link is in the show notes, so make sure to click on that and uh, help us support all of our content. And thank you all so much that have already donated, oh, yeah. or for our patrons as well. We cannot thank you enough. Again, the reason that this is all existing is thanks to your support. Speaking of, yeah, I think we need some more storage around here <laughs> after today. Yes, after we breaking definitely down need to buy set. some shelves and stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. So my brother turned me on to this series recently. Ooh, cool. Have you watched it? Uh, I've heard about it. I've seen some trailers and it looks pretty cool. The VFX look fun too. Yeah, so YouTube, as it turns out, and low am I to sing the praises of YouTube, but here we go. Uh, they do have some original content. Yep. Uh, YouTube Originals. Yeah. It's an original name. And they have YouTube Red also, which is a subscription-based service mm -hmm. similar to Netflix or something else, which is one of the reasons they're doing original content so that people sign up for that stuff. So there's a show called Impulse, which is by Doug Lyman, I believe, who is the person that did a lot of stuff, but the one that matters here is a, a movie called Jumper. Ah, Jumper. So he's got a show, Impulse. It's on YouTube. The good thing is you can Wait, watch... this makes perfect sense now that I've seen the trailer. Okay, yes. keep going. <laughs> yeah, you can watch the first season of Impulse for free. You don't need YouTube oh, Red. Right. So that's the great thing about it here. And then if you want to watch season two, which I haven't started yet, uh, but I hear is better than season one, you do have to sign up for YouTube Red. But they have a free 30-day trial, so you could watch it and then just cancel it or whatever you want to do. Anyway... Impulse, until, until the yeah. day the Command Zone podcast puts content up on YouTube Red or YouTube Red Originals, you will not see us necessarily yeah. declaring support for it. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the end of I'm that. definitely not saying to sign up for YouTube Red. But, but you can watch you, the first season and decide And the there. second one for free with the 30-day trial. Yeah. This is not sponsored, obviously, because... Wh okay. This is also just how you use the internet, people, yeah. okay? You guys I don't know, know how many <laughs> memberships I've canceled when I'm like, I, you know, it was, it was fun while it lasted. Hulu, like I don't know. Like, I just you know. joined the thing to get the one thing, and now I'm gone. Yeah. That's pretty normal. Yeah, yeah. It's, trust me, you don't feel bad. In fact, the business actually relies on that as part of the income as well. So, Impulse is a show about a girl who sort of starts to realize that she has some superpowers, and it's mostly like teleportation and some telekinesis stuff, and which is very similar to the movie jumper that's not just some casual stuff josh that's serious business yeah dude. superpowers Those are superpowers yeah i thought you're like i can bend a spoon oh, dude. <laughs> she's not in the matrix okay, don't get, right, don't right. get your world <laughs> okay, mixed up. Okay. actually she might be i have no idea 
Um, but it's 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 well done. It's high production value. Uh, the acting and the writing is professional, and cool. it is a fun watch. And you know, it, since all of our TVs are smart TVs now, and you just watch YouTube the same as Netflix on your TV. Like I kind of got into it, and we binged like half of the first season just the other night. So oh. I just wanted to say that yeah, we enjoyed it so far. Where, what's the girl's power level on one to ten? <laughs> She's learning, so She's she learning? doesn't even know how to control most of it. So oh, okay. kind of like yeah, it just is like three to four then maybe with the potential to ten. I'm assuming. I mean, I'm assuming there's a, a side plot storyline that that you kind of get touches of that just kind of gives you, I think, to flesh out the world and the possibilities of That's like cool. a person who has similar powers to hers and knows how to use them is out oh, there. Cool. But you don't really know much about them. Is so. it Siler? The hero killer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's Siler. Oh, but. darn. <laughs> <laughs> That's an old reference. That's um, a very old reference. Yeah. Don't watch so, that show. All Im- right. <laughs> Impulse on YouTube. We went round and round about how YouTube works. I hope you got it. Uh, anyway. Oh, I'm going to check it out now because I yeah. did like Jumper a lot. I, I It was fun. It was fun. Jumper is one of those wish fulfillment movies. Like, listen, it's not great. The acting's pretty bad. What's his name from? Uh, he's just, you know, listen, I'm sure he's a nice guy, but he's not yeah. the greatest actor. And But it was like, oh, I want to be able to do that. Yeah, that, totally. That, that looks like fun. Yeah. So Impulse has that same same sort Sweet. of thing going on yeah well i do love i also love those stories where someone starts off with powers can't handle them and learns to control them because that's a very satisfying arc and no we're matter in, the story and we're i'm addicted to that kind of thing too yeah we're in that time period i think uh you know not to get into the hullabaloo around scorsese and all the rest of it but we're in that time period right now where we're sort of exploring superhero movies in a lot of different angles and one of the ways is like oh but not in the Marvel movie sense, how would a superhero with superpowers, a person, like, how would that actually work in the real world? In the real world, yeah. Yeah, how would that manifest and what would happen around that person? And that this kind of explores some of those things, which I do find interesting. Yep, me too. All right, another thing that we find very interesting, because there are a lot of interesting, happen- interesting things happening in and around their format, is our sister podcast, The Masters of Modern. You can find them on Twitter at the MMCast. It's Ben... Bateman, Alex, Kessler. I switched the reason. The, it's A and B. It's so easy, right? Yeah, well, it, it works. I also never know whether they say Jimmy or Josh and Josh or Jimmy because, like, they're both J's. So I'm just like, eh. It's always Jimmy and then Josh. Uh, it just makes know. it easy. I just like Josh and Jimmy. It has a good ring to it, too. You know, there's balance in the world. Now you know which of us is responding to you because if it says Jimmy and Josh, I typed it. If it says <laughs> Josh and Jimmy, Jimmy typed it. That's very nice. Uh, anyway, they talk about all things uh, modern in the modern format. Pioneer is also something that just got announced recently and is going to shake things up in terms of how cards actually get passed into modern. So I I think that's going to be an interesting discussion that they're going to have. There's a lot to talk about in Modern in general. And uh, if Modern Horizons was a success, we may see more like that in the future. If you want to get into Modern and you want to turn your Commander deck into a Modern deck, also very easy. Check out these guys. Check out their podcast at the MM Cast. You can also find them right next to us on Collected.Company. All right. Our editing, graphics, and logistics team is Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Alfred Estaca, Terry Robertson, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, and Sam Waldo. It's our family. That's right. And then our uncle is Jeffrey Palmer, who does the <laughs> Living Card Animation. Our crazy uncle. Yeah, he doesn't live with us, uh, but you can find him on Twitter at, tw- at Living Cards MTG. He does awesome animations, obviously, at the front and end of our show, as well as the set behind us. Thanks, Jeff. All right, everybody. And thank you out there for listening. And we'll see you next time. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>